Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Dr. Anne Matthew, um, is a researcher who specialises in corporations law and innovation economics and entrepreneurship. She's kind of been particularly interested in the way in which the legal imagination deals with new technologies, uh, such as robotics and 3D printing. Dr. Anne Matthew. Oh, thank you very much to Professor Rimmer for inviting me to come and speak to you all today. Um, talking about um, the promise of legal imagination for our new technologies in innovative industries, such as those that find their way into maker spaces and 3D printing. In a nutshell, my paper today uh, acknowledges that the maker movement is built upon a proud tradition of imagination and creativity, and that if, as a society, we value these contributions, and the promise that they hold for a better future for humanity, then we must be prepared to think differently about the current laws and regulations that impose upon these spaces. Or to put it another way, the law must itself embark upon a program of innovation. Harari has argued that the most ingenious human invention was the greatest figment of legal imagination, the company. Harari argues that legal imagination has since that point stalled. Scientific imagination has not. And this paper takes up the gauntlet that's been thrown down by Harari, but focuses mostly on explaining why such a bold call to action is imperative. Firstly, this paper is going to outline how the company can be conceived of as a human invention and what novelties it introduced at that time to the market. Secondly, it will consider precisely how, a, how seismic a shift in thinking this innovation was in order to get lawmakers at that time convinced to commit to the introduction of such an innovation. And finally, this paper argues that legal innovation is necessary in order for the law and its regulations to ensure that the legal environment is well positioned to ensure a flourishing innovation sector that can ultimately contribute to the betterment of society. Now, as we know, or you will by the time I'm finished with you, the company is simply a device. It's an artificial legal person. While corporate law historians can trace the origins of the company back to ancient Roman grain traders, it was not until 200 years ago that the easy creation of companies was made possible by legislators. That law introduced novel concepts of limited liability Limited liability allows people to invest in companies in such a way as to ensure that their liability for the debts of the company is limited to a specific amount. And generally, that amount is calculated by reference to their, the limit of what they've paid already for their shares. This law further enhanced the attractiveness of investment in corporations and involvement in management of them by recognising that these limited liability companies had separate legal personality. And fundamentally, this meant that companies could easily be formed, enter contracts, hold property in their own names, be liable on their own account, such, as, such that managers and investors were not going to be liable for the debts of the company. The company would. This was an enormous leap forward. These were the consequences of incorporating as a company. It became a separate legal entity, separate from its investors, separate from its shareholders, separate from its managers, even if the company was simply a shell for a single person managing and investing in the company. So together, these two notions that were innovative at the time, limited liability and separate legal entity, have since become seminal doctrines of corporate law. They encourage investors to participate in the successes and profits of the company, free from any concern about their ongoing indebtedness for the company's debts. So why is it 
that the law introducing easy formation of companies with this separate legal personhood and limited liability was novel. Well, the answer to that question takes us back even further in legal history. Historically, failure to pay debts was a heinous crime. When Shakespeare's Shylock called for a pound of Antonio's flesh, should he fail to pay his indebtedness, this was actually reflective of the law at the, of the day. Research into the history of bankruptcy law in the United Kingdom, from which our own bankruptcy law has developed, reveals that this notion of a pound of flesh to satisfy debts is actually from ancient Roman law that emerged in approximately 450 BC. It was subsequently found to be talked about in the Justinian's Corpus Juris Civilis, one of our most ancient legal documents. And legal historians have reached consensus as to what the Justinian rule of law on bankruptcy was, and I'd like to read it to you. It says, the law establishes a procedure to be followed after judgment has been entered against a debtor for failure to pay a debt within 30 days of that judgment. After that, the arrest of the debtor may be made by laying on hands. Bring him to court. If no person offers themselves as surety, the debtor is to be taken before the praetor court on three successive market days and the amount of their debtedness, indebtedness will be publicly announced. So this appears to have been in order to inflict maximum shame on the debtor. But the law goes on to state that that would not be enough. On the third market day, the debtor would be subject to capital punishment or sold into slavery for failure to pay their debts. So these approaches to failure to pay debts actually became deeply entrenched in insolvency law. And in 1706, it was still possible to be hung for failure to pay your debts or to cooperate with the um, person looking after your bankruptcy. In fact, this account of um, the execution of Perrot bears a remarkable similarity to the explanation from Justinian. On Wednesday, November 11, 1761, the condemned debtor was taken from his cell in London's Newgate prison. He prayed with the chaplain, received the sacrament, shackled and his hands bound. Pale and trembling, he prayed while his indebtedness was announced to the crowd before he was launched into eternity. Now, Perrot was not the last bankrupt to be hung in the United Kingdom for failure to pay his debts but his execution was really well documented because there was already the beginnings of a public rumbling that perhaps this might not be the ultimate way to handle indebtedness. And in just 60 years, so to pause for a moment, that is the state of the law from ancient Rome until 1761. But in just 30 years after that, the death penalty for bankruptcy was abolished and a further 30 years after that, limited liability was introduced in these companies to allow you to invest in companies free of concerns about being liable for the company's debt. My point is that the introduction of this new way of thinking about the benefits of risk-taking in investment and the easy formation of companies with limited liability and artificial personality should have been heralded for uh, the seismic leap that it made in legal thinking. Lawmakers were sceptical as to whether limited liability would bear all the promise it had hoped. It was hoped that it would benefit middle class and working classes of society. So Parliament in the United Kingdom invited philosophers to come onto the floor of the Parliament to talk about the various possibilities for improving social conditions. One of those philosophers was John Stuart Mill. The record indicates that Mill gave evidence before the Senate committee for a number of days and that he was interrogated with a series of concerns for the prospect of limited liability and if it could potentially have 
the beneficial economic and social benefits that it was touted to have. To give you an example, Mill was asked, do you think if it were introduced with such regulations and such safeguards, it would give additional facility for enterprise directed by intelligent and create additional facilities for investment among the working classes? And John Stuart Mill replied, I think it would do both of these things, which is very important. It would enable personal qualities to obtain in a greater degree than they can now in the advantages to which the use and aid of capital affords. It would enable persons of integrity and capacity to hold credit and share more freely in the advantages which are now confined to a great degree to the rich. So these were... Uh, seismic changes in thinking about indebtedness and uh, liability for debts. They were driven by a policy imperative to lift social conditions by creating greater opportunity for engagement in economic activity. And it was hoped that both would flow from greater willingness to form companies and expanded market conditions for investors. Mill saw limited liability as capable of generating increased economic activity because it would encourage this much broader range of people to be able to participate in investment, particularly those in the middle and working classes. And Mill was right. The effect of the change to the law and its regulation was almost immediate and it had a breathtaking influence on the way business is still conducted worldwide today. In a, this innovation in law had a truly breathtaking effect on the development of corporate law. And as of this morning, there were 2.8 million companies in Australia, all bar a few thousand of them have limited liability. All are separate legal entities. More than 99% of 2.8 million companies are extremely small entities with less than 20 employees. Companies have proliferated and prospered to such an extent that they are almost ever-present and in that they touch and influence every single aspect of our daily lives almost. This detailed analysis of this lasting genius invention of lawyers is important to fully understand the possibility for innovation in law. We accept that innovation generally is conceptualised as a process that can have profound economic um, effect that begins with challenging the customary way of doing things. Both innovation and entrepreneurship are critical to economic development that is accepted. And innovation in law is clearly demonstrated as having the same potential effect. Not all of the effects of limited liability were positive. There were social impacts associated with supporting the introduction and sustaining of the policy. And many of these policies are still in place today. They include policies that are directed at uh, taking on as a public the burden of some losses where the innovation policy has actually operated as planned. The company may fail and the people behind the company are not liable for the debts of the company, but more vulnerable creditors are exposed by the successful application of the policy supporting uh, limited liability. They can be um, employees that are left unpaid. And the government has schemes that are um, put into place to support these employees and uh, allows them to claim on statutory funds in those circumstances. So let's ask now whether further legal innovation is necessary in uh, a technology innovation context. Further innovation, I think, is necessary to address the legal and regulatory issues that arise in encouraging and supporting a flourishing innovation sector from its ground roots in the maker movement to the commercialisation of large projects in public companies. The impacts of regulation include that it might direct the future of innovation, or to put this another way, regulation has 
the capacity to impact ingenuity and appetite to engage in innovation might be overwhelmed should regulation focus on concerns for short-term risk or unintended consequences. Regulation should instead be focused on the social objectives that underpin its policy direction. While there is certainly a place for risk management, what could possibly go wrong if we allow risk management to drive the impetus for innovation in the first place? Lawyers are trained from their very first day in law school to focus on all the various ways and means that things could possibly go wrong. And perhaps this is why there has been no major innovation in law. Perhaps this contributes to why law and regulation is so slow to respond and recognise the regulatory problems that arise with innovation. This goes beyond a pacing problem caused by poorly understood technological innovation. Rather, the blue sky thinking of makers seems entirely at odds with the wet blanket of the law. Law and regulation is consumed with fitting new regulatory problems into existing regulatory frameworks. How is this the same as what we have experienced before? Can existing regulations cover any risks that arise with this innovation? This has been a fraught conversation in relation to the introduction of many innovations. Then in my own research, I have explored it in relation to the introduction of fintech technologies. Such an approach seems to remove from the table a consideration of how the law could be improved to the betterment of a flourishing innovation sector and the social benefits that may come of that. Yes, there are risks. That is undoubtedly the case, just as it was with the advent of easily formed limited liability companies. Yes, there may be abuse. Yes, there may be a period of adjustment of failed experimentation in regulation and experimental improvement. Just as there was with the introduction of easily formed limited liability in com companies. Would embarking on a program of innovation in law and regulation potentially help secure the economic and social benefits that we hope to achieve? We will only know if we try. Legal imagination is not evident in the current approach to the regulation of robotics. Rather, the law and regulation is cautiously building ever more complex frameworks intently focused on runaway risks and ethical considerations. This process is fraught for regulators who may be struggling to keep up with the pace of innovation and don't have full or complete information about the nature or the extent of the regulatory problems that might be presented by robotic innovations that happen to emerge within their regulatory scope. This struggle can include a lack of confidence that the innovation does fall squarely within their regulatory scope, and they may take a wait and see approach to see exactly in which regulatory scope the problems do end up arising. In a collaborative research project I'm undertaking with um, Professor Rimmer and uh, uh, Dr Arnold at the back of the room and uh, my colleague uh, uh, Michael Giho and uh, Paula Dutson from the Business Fact School, it is intended that we will explore the innovation law and policy challenges arising with robotics in innovative industries. My elements of this project include a focus on what ingenuity and imagination could bring in developing novel responses to innovation, particularly that emerging innovation that's at the heart of the earliest and fledgling stages of entrepreneurial innovation, and in more mature firms at the inflection point where prototypes can be taken to the next level towards commercial exploitation. It's hoped that collaboration and cooperation with the robotics community will generate some useful empirical data 
rich and useful for informing the nature of the regulatory problems and how legal innovation itself could not only provide solutions, but new opportunities for growth and risk taking. The research team intends to interview policymakers, technology transfer managers, regulators, those at the coalface of robotics innovation, robotics engineers and users in Australia and abroad. Surveys that gauge worker and consumer experiences of robotics in the workplace and consumer environments are also going to be deployed. And this data will inform a deeper understanding of the possibilities for the regulatory frameworks. A certain nimbleness of thinking that's unclouded by what could possibly go wrong will be needed to generate possibilities for legal innovation. For example, a new legal fiction could be created specifically for robots or algorithms with particular characteristics. This may or may not involve artificial legal personality, but it has the potential for thinking differently about the regulation of robotics to create new foundational building blocks for regulating against risk. Alternatively, something less ambitious, ambitious could involve the registration of robots attended by certain freedoms such as moratoriums on litigation or tax advantages. These could all be considered. This such a scheme could be supported by public insurance schemes to compensate those that are the real losers in the innovation game. That is, those who suffer when the policy does work as planned and intended. This could include people harmed by robots, businesses that fail due to robotic automation in their industry, retraining schemes for employees and employee compensation schemes. At its most ambitious, policy port support for an innovation agenda could extend to a universal basic income for such employees. Incentives that will matter to makers should be at the forefront of such considerations. Possibilities outside the box might involve grappling with the artificial personality of robots, whether a purpose-built form of artificial legal personality might be useful in supporting further innovation and also providing the building blocks for regulating against risk. The overarching driver of legal innovation should be social concerns. The question that lawmakers and regulators should ask themselves when um, interrogating their own policies is how will this lead to the betterment of society and is it worth the risks? Focusing on deepening our understandings of both of these points is critical if society is ultimately to reap both the long-term economic and social benefits of a flourishing innovation sector. If you have any other ideas or you would like to discuss um, some of my uh, blue sky thinking, I'd be very uh, interested in speaking to you. Thank you. Thank you.